Yeah, so today we have KJ uh, from a Pua's group who uh, is finally getting his wish uh, since we started the art club in 2018, which was to take over the art club and make it a Python club. Um, and so uh, KJ, I would say is um, our uh, Python data scientist star at Libre. And um, like, I personally don't know much about Python and I'm looking forward to learning with KJ about it through the next five sessions. I mean, it won't be the immediate next five, right? But in the coming months. Thank you, KJ. Thanks. So I have attempted to put down a syllabus so that we can start with the basics to get to using some basic machine learning stuff. So we won't talk about neural networks after we're done with the five, but we, you should be able to be do like a random course uh, with the skit learn and be very confident with yourself when we're done. Uh, so that's the goal from the five series. So I'm going to start with the basics and I may or may not highlight things that I really, really love. Uh, who knows? I have made, so I've I found since like sharing code with stuff with people, I found this Google collab where they, it's mostly for Python. Uh, so it's not super useful with R, I think. Uh, but you, I have added the, the link in the our slide notes and I, I, it lives where the material is at and I put the link here. If you want, you can just save the file to your Google Drive and then you can interact with it. It's because I'm working on it. I, obviously, I didn't have people share it as a shared thing. But that's this disclaimer. So at any point, if you have some questions, let me know. I've tried to frame it in the, the way that you know do how to do R. And like by now, most people are pretty comfortable with R now. So most of the stuff I'm going to do is in context with R. So there's some links in here. Uh, and this kind of follows loosely this Braggle course. Now, I don't know if you can see that. But anyway, if you follow the link, uh, it talks about must a lot of that stuff. The Kregel course assumes you know no code whatsoever. Uh, so I'm going to probably brief on things while that goes into more detail. Uh, so today, hopefully, I'm just going to talk about Python syntax, functions, help, uh, Boolean conditioning, lists, loops, and strings and dictionaries. Are you in with strings and dictionaries? Because those are probably going to be the dictionary is the one thing that's kind of really different uh, between R and Python. And then I got a helpful like a cheat sheets. Uh, they said this is actually pretty useful uh, cheat sheet. If you forget something, you can just save it, look up something, and then you remember. So uh, in this thing, you can just like run the whole thing. And the basic thing is just same stuff with R. So for variables, you assign variables the exact same way. The only difference is there is only one way to assign variables, and that's with the equal sign. There's no arrow this way. There's no arrow that way. You can do it one way, one way only. No weird assignments. This is the only way to assign a variable. Uh, and so it works just like you expect it to. And the print is used a lot in, in, uh, in Python, which is not so much used in R. Uh, sometimes I run into that issue where I have to either cat it to the screen or print it. But we use the print a lot here. And it's just a built-in function. You can use it out of the box. What's very important is as if you're doing Python 2, which you should be, because Python, if you're doing Python 3, which you should be, OK, because Python 2 is dead. And I do mean that it is dead. Do not resurrect that. We're not doing zombies here. Leave Python in the gray. Python 3 requires this print statement to have the parentheses. So please just remember to do that. And then numbers are pretty much the same. There's, you, they're pretty much the same as in R and Python. You, you know, you add 
You can subtract, you can multiply, you can do divide, you can do the exponential and you can negate. And that does exactly what you expect it should do. Uh, there are some differences between R and Python, and this is the ones I'm gonna talk about. In R, the floor division here, is a little bit different. You just do two backslashes while in R you've got to have the little parentheses around it. So if you're if you're used to doing the four version where it cuts out the it rounds, then you just do two slashes. And the same thing here with the remainder in, in R, you've got two parentheses, but here you just need to do one. Oh, sorry, one quick question. So yeah, I made a copy of your um um notebook file to my drive right yes and then um let's say those boxes there right they see it they appear for me as um eight cells hidden 24 cells hidden nine cells hidden how do i see you them click click it click the box because like i says it has one cell hitting when you click the hidden box it'll appear and like there's 24 cents hitting and you just click it and they'll up here. You can also go back the other way. I find that this Python thing, and this is completely different, the Google thing that they're doing here, they've kind of made it very similar, not to Jupyter Notebook, but to like an org mode file where you can just close the tabs back and forth. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's interesting. I don't know how I feel about it yet. Uh, and then the thing to also consider that I that you can run into a big problem, especially if you're coming from an R background, is that this here, which would be considered the exponents, does not work. It's it's not the same thing at all. You must use the dot dot if you're going to try to do the raise to the power of b. So, if you're wondering why something is giving you an error, that probably or gives you something you weren't expecting, it pretty, pretty much works. Uh, another major difference with R and Python is that R has a lot of nice built-in functions where you can do like fancy math, like square roots and stuff. The Python is very, very like limited. It's very small, it's very compact. You have to import stuff, which we'll talk about in the next session. I'm not gonna talk about that now, uh, but it does have some basic, basic math. So absolutes, mins, max, rounds, infants, stuff like this. These work exactly the same, you know, as you would probably have them in R. So I won't go into too much detail, but I want to list here that, you know, they're here. You don't have to import anything if you just want to do like a basic calculator. In fact, I do use Python as a calculator a lot. Uh, what I did find interesting was the differences between Python and R's help function. So you've got the question mark when you're working with the help uh, in Python. In, in in R, in Python, it's just, it's a help function. And you can have this on any kind of function here, max, and it will tell you everything that has to do with that function. And put it in here, just remember not to put the little parentheses and you should be fine. So that's like a real quick spiel of the functions bit. Now we're getting into actually defining your own function. So the key here is that indentations matter. There's a lot of flexibility in R where you can literally write a function in one line. You cannot do that here. Uh, you can never write a function in one line, not the way you would consider a function. And instead of saying func, we use the def, which is definition or you're defining something. And there ends with a semicolon. So there's no curly brackets. It's a colon. You use the def, and then you either use a tab, four spaces or two spaces. You just must be consistent. And it does need to be indented. So I got here just like the regular square root function. Or you have def here, square root, here's your variable, and then you end with this kind of nice colon. And then here, because I do prefer four spaces when I'm doing it normally, I got here, it's four spaces. You're returning, and then it works just to expect. And now you have square. What's kind of cool, and I don't know if R does this. I finally found this out when I was 
writing this up, is that you can actually put your define functions in help and it will then return you that find function. So if you instead redefine, um, yeah. So I haven't been able to, to get to where you are right now. Um, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen briefly just to see if, um, Um, uh, so, um, yes, let me make this bigger. Um, I, so I made a copy of it, and so if I click, wait, still a minute. So if I click here to expand, yeah, eyes again. <laughs> so I feel like I'm on this infinite loop where I can't get to see the the code. Like um, if I try to edit it, right? Uh, the only thing I'm able to edit is the title. Um, okay. I can't see the the content here. So. Well, then I don't mind sharing this as an editor. Uh, so I think maybe that what happened was that um, in whatever status you had it, that's how I got it copied. So for example, this one, this code chunk is visible, this Fritz one, right? But the other ones are hidden and... Uh, yeah, no, I'm gonna put in the chat, the edible one, I just would, if you could save this edited one as a different link and not, Play around with it. I mean, you can play around with it. I don't know if it's going to be that big of a deal, but it's probably easier if you say that way. Tell me if that works because. Yeah, I'm loading it right now, the new one. Um, yeah. hmm. Wait, which was the bad one? Is the which link? Is the one on the Google Drive okay? Because I feel like mine's been behaving fine. Like I'm able to edit it and it says cannot save changes, which I believe is what you wanted. Mm. Now, if you can't see the little bubble, then try this other link. If you're fine, then. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is it working now? Did that one work for you? Uh, not really. No. Nope. Uh -huh. No, I don't know. I said, it sounds like I have some specific problem that uh, we can solve later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's, that's kind of, uh, it's rough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, well, man, sucks to be you, uh, but also, I suppose you could always just make another, uh, a new, a new notebook. I was just talking about defining your squares. So Python has this triple quote, which we'll talk a little bit about later, where it, instead of just the single quote, and you can write exactly what you like. So this does some stuff. And then you can put the input is a variable. Output square the variable. And we do help. It will then give back when it takes its 10 years to run. One thing I cannot stand is this the low connection speeds in this virtual machine but it's better than having to download everything. Okay. 
I don't have the patience. Anyway, when you put it in the help here, it then gives you back everything in here. So including the example I wrote, so you can make your functions very detailed and then help will give you exactly what you need for that function, even though it's just defined in your, uh, in your code or in your notebook. Uh, and then R is really smart where like, if you don't give it something to return, it will still return the last thing properly. Um, Python is not so much. It will return nothing because you told it to return nothing. Uh, and it also does not print to the screen just whatever has been given to it. So if you need, if you just want to run this and have it print every time, you do need to tell it to print it or return the value. So there's that. There's no inherent, okay, you made a function, it's going to assume you want to return something. It, it makes no assumption. Uh, what I do like, and what you guys will probably find super, super useful, is that when you make a function, you can have something return multiple values, and you do not need to put that stuff in a list. So if I want to do this function that does something, and it does, I just randomly did some arithmetic, it returns these two things here, and you can put those two things in a variable, separated here, like so and then it will do something. What's even cooler though, and let me add this function is, say you only want the first one. You can also have it return just the number 10. It's expecting two things. So you do have to give it two variables, but you can just pick and choose, which I found very useful for doing uh, specific functions that you need to do over and over again. Uh, but you don't need it for both sides. So here's some more some functions that just show off the fact that you can call a function in a function uh, and you can print a bunch of both a function and a call. Uh, you could do the same thing in, in, in R. It's not particularly different. And then this is pretty much more of the print function here. Uh, this was kind of, if you're not aware, you can tell it to, to print on a new line or a tab. It doesn't have to be a space. And you can input uh, functions like this. They have inputs where you're inputting stuff into a function that can get kind of complicated. Uh, I feel like that's pretty much the, the lowdown for functions. Uh, any questions? Otherwise, I'm just going to go straight into the conditions and Boolean. What is that modify plane? That was, that was the previous function? Yeah, this oh, modify, yeah, it returns the remainder of X after dividing by five. And so here's like, which is bigger against the modified module. So it's actually doing this inputting a function into a function. So the max is a function and then it inputs these vid thing here into the modify and then it's returning that based off of, hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a nested function. So the, um, like if this was R, um, you don't have curly braces, I guess here for um, saying for the function starts, but like here you're saying this function yeah. starts here and it ends, mm -hmm. it ends at the end of the print? No, so. Or it ends after the return? It ends after the return. As soon as you put return, you just need one line of space and then it's, so yeah, the curly brackets, it also like, it has to, anything in the function is its system. So this indentation is telling it what the function is. 
And as soon as you leave that indentation, it's saying, okay, that there's no longer, I'm no longer in the function environment. So you can't define the environment. You just say, okay, I'm starting a function. So if we write this here at the top, you're gonna to get an error because they're like, okay, we expect you to put something here. And then you can put something here. It doesn't have to be a return. You can just say X and this works. Uh, and then as soon as you put something here, five, this is now not part of the function. Now, if we put something here, y, like y equals x plus five, and then we write x equals zero or something. This isn't part of the function and we're in a different environment. I personally don't like to put the function the like proper code would have two lines so you can see that these are two different things and in general with like jupyter notebook i would just separate out the function from the code so you don't get confused uh but i, I have a harder time manipulating these uh, collab notebooks this here would work and you can see it more clearly that they're not actually in the same thing. But yeah, oh, very important. Yeah, very, very important distinction. Mm -hmm. No curly brackets to tell you what is the function. It's all this indentation that says the function, what's in the function. And so just like a shortcut, I made this little table that says you know, the difference between uh python and r and the difference is this don't put all capital letters <laughs> it's pretty quite simple uh, although i i will tell you that i often forget which series i'm writing in and then if it throws up a this is not a thing can't find your variable then i just do the opposite uh, so it's not that big of a deal but lowercase and then you're good i feel like you're all almost ready to write in python comp in fact, all the operations you use in R for these conditions are the same here. We can, this is again where you have, this is the function and then this is the action after the function and then add it together, some string inputs. The and, or, or not, you can literally just say and, and it will test both, you can replace that not and it will replace not or or those letters or you can use the symbols uh, as well they're roughly the same and if one doesn't work just normally if there's two in r just use one in python and you should be good so if you need to use the n percent and you need to do two of them to get that to work in r drop one of them and it will work in in python this is just an example of making sure you use this correctly uh, for order of operations because they're not the same statement. It's doing the and before the or. Okay, now conditional loops. This is also going to be similar. So like how are everything in uh, that's being defined in these kind of functional things uses the curly brackets. We're going to do the exact same thing here uh, for your statements and it uses the exact same number of spaces you should be consistent as long as you're consistent you're fine and again it you define your if statement by saying it's an if statement and then the end of your semicolon and then you make sure you indent anything within the indented is part of that statement and then the else if is else if else if else and it should work just fine so what is you will notice is missing is they do not have the else if statement that uh, R has where you can write one line of code, uh, but they do have list comprehension, which I'm going to talk about soon. 
and that's as close as you get from the if else uh, substitute. It's actually better than the if else substitute because I've seen that the if else statement in R will run into some basic errors based on the difficulty of the uh, arithmetic. So, list. This is pretty big difference, uh, but I think quite easy to keep in mind. Instead of doing your little C and then the uh, per, uh, parentheses thing, you just do square brackets. And it works exactly the same. Uh, you can do a clustered one, just like you can do an R. You can combine different types, including a function. And I think you can probably do that in R too. I'm not sure about the function, but you can definitely do uh, variables and different variables as well. Yeah? Uh, you can do that with a, with a list function in R, not with a C function in R. Oh, you can't combine with uh, the C? With the C function in R, everything, they're, they're they're called atomic vectors. They have to be the same type. With a list uh, function, they can be anything. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so I mean, the behavior you're showing here with, from Python is equivalent to the list function in R, not to the C function. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, then, scratch that. This is closer to the list function. I also I thought the list was closer to a dictionary, but like kind of, sort of, sort of. Uh, I would say that like a named list is closer to a dictionary. There you um, go. Fake. But uh, yeah. Oh gosh. Well then, yeah. Okay, you have to use this as a list. Uh, for for Python, a basic vector here with the the brackets is just the same. They don't have anything here where you just have a vector where it has to be all the same. And then this is just slicing and indexing. Uh, the a very, very, very big thing uh, about the difference is that R indexes on base one. So that means if you start on one, you're going to get the first element. Python uses base zero. So the first element in fruits is, the, is zero. So just do minus one, and you should be fine. And then one is the second element that will screw people over all the time. Uh, and then you can access the last one, but minus one. I'm not sure you can do that in R. I kept sometimes I try, and then it gives me a, a an error. But I do know you can definitely do minus one here and minus two, and you just go backwards in the list. And minus one in R would be uh, drop the first element and keep everything else. Okay. So yeah, I didn't think it would work. It, I know it normally does not work in R. So this is nice when you want to just go to the back of the list. And it does kind of what you expect it to do. You say you want the last on, so give me the, the one in the back. And then it can go forward or backwards. And you can do the same thing with the splicing, where if you do zero to one, you'll get the first two uh, because it goes up to that index number. So it does not include the number two, which would be the third item. And then if you leave this empty, it will go all the way to the end. So if you don't know how big something is and you know what I find like specifically for like if you're doing G, um, a big data frame with counts from like feature counts and it has this annotation and you know the annotation is like six columns, but you have no idea how long it is or you don't or it's going to be variable between a couple of different things. Just having this go to the end is super helpful. So you just want to take the first uh, you want to get rid of the first two or you want to take the first three or something like that. And this one uh, pretty much drops the first one and the last element, so you just get the middle. Are we get with slicing? <laughs> so let's say you had um, a four element vector, right? Yes. A go from two, which is the third element, um yeah. like what what would happen if you to test this um bracket go from two to um which is the third element to let's say uh minus three 
which is the second element. Okay. Yeah. So you, you get yeah because it didn't get anything. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure we were just gonna like do a reverse thing and give you the third element and then the second element. Yeah, no, that's good one. So it does okay. seem like what something Python would do though. Like <laughs> there's a lot of like uh, tricks with lists. You can do a lot of funky things without a lot of um, commands, mm -hmm. um, but I guess not quite that. Yeah, it's not that one. I wasn't sure what it would do actually. So I was it's very curious because <laughs> it can be, suspect um uh so the thing that is a little bit different from r and python is that while this kind of list is a mutable list uh that we have unmutable lists so here what i mean by mutable list that means you have got this fruits again if i want to change bananas which is the actually the number two this was just keeping this good. if i want to change bananas to pineapples, then I can do that, no problem. Uh, and then you can see the fruits here. Now we're going with bananas. I can add with just a pin. Now we have star fruits, uh, but you know, oranges, I'm not into oranges, so you can just remove oranges here. Uh, and then you're like, okay, does it does it remove all incidents of oranges, or does it in do just the first? So I've got this animals to show you that it's just going to remove the first instance of something. You want to get rid of all the dogs, you're going to have to do that multiple times, or some better replacement probably. And then you can also pop. Pop is a little bit different from remove because it tells you what it's about to remove. So theoretically, you can assign pop to a different variable, keep it later, and then put it back. So let's say I want to pop mangoes. It's no longer in fruits, but I saved it. So if I want to, I can go back and put that right back. Uh, it won't go in the order because it's not how it's going to work, but it will add it to the end. I didn't tell it to print the thing. This does in place. So we're going to have two mangoes at the end because I have to do the choice. Uh, and then you can manipulate this like you can do in, in R. A length is just LN, so you would, in R, you'd have to spell that out. I find that I am very lazy and those last three characters are just too much for me some days, uh, but in general, it's not that bad. Uh, you can sort, you can sum, you can do max and min, all those things you can do quite easily on a list. You can search. So say you want to find the index that has Mars in it. You just put the name in there. You put index. Uh, it does this trailing dot. You'll notice that's pretty much, I should have gone over names. So like, unlike R, do not, you can't name variables with a dot in between because this is how it's, that's the applying a function. So any dot started, and you're, you're, you're looking for something. And then you're like, oh, where's Mars in this planet? It's number three. And you can test to see if things are in here. You can do the same thing in, in, in R though. Earth is in planets, yes. What I find interesting is you can put this list <laughs> that you have made into help and it will give you the def give you what a list is. It's like, oh, you've made a list. Here's what it is. Uh, and then it has all the things you can do to that list in the help function, how it's iterable and stuff like that. You can clear a pin, copy, stuff you can put in it, stuff you can do with it. If you ever kind of forget, you've got a nice place to work if you don't want to Google. And, and then 
you know, that's pretty much the end of, you know, the, the mutable list. Now, the tuples, and I could be butchering how to say this, but the tuples, those are a, like a list, except you cannot modify. So these are the unmutable. So you have your list, your regular lists with the square brackets, the parentheses things here. These are tuples. And if you don't have anything when you move it like this, you're like, what, what does this even mean? It's just making a tuple. I don't, I don't think I've ever done this before in my life, but this is, I, I, it's good to know that if you put it like this, you're, you're just gonna make a tuple. Now, I have this here uh, just to just show you that you can, if you attempt to assign something to a tuple, it will tell you, oh, you can't assign anything. This is a tuple. Uh, so that's why making uh, the difference between the mutable list and the tuple is important. It kind of preserves what's in there. Like, I'm pretty sure you meant you just wanted to save this, right? Uh, I found this pretty cool. Uh, as integer ratio, it's just a function you can apply. The point is that it's returning two values, just like we did previously in that old other function that was random. And you can assign it just like before, and then you can print it here. Same as same as, as cake. And this is kind of what it's doing. It's outputting a triple. And this swap variable also I found quite cool. You would think this would not work. And I've put this in MATLAB kind of work. You can do this in your way. You can swap the variables just by reassigning them in this kind of triple order. Found that that tickled my fancy. Don't ask me why, but it did. Uh, okay. Any more? Any? You might have any questions on the difference between the tuples and then the regular list? Mm. Can you take a? Can you convert between them? Can you convert it? I don't remember. I'm not needed to convert a tuple to a list because normally what I do is I just reassign it. Um, like is there something like the as dot integer as dot something equivalent from one? Let's see. I believe there is. I think you can um, just type list around and in parentheses of the uh, object or two, same thing for tuple um, to cast it. Mm. Like maybe you realize that you have something that you that was a tuple and now you want to actually edit it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Cool. Uh, now, what would you do for? To this, I not needed to do this before, so let us tuple it. Is there also like an equivalent of the class function in R where you can you can tell you okay what that what type of object are we looking at? You can do type, which will tell you what object you're looking at. Yes. I was also thinking of D type, but I think that's very specific to pandas. So type class, that'll give you the class thing you want. Mm -hmm. And that works for everything pretty much. And then you can convert classes. I think I skimmed over it, uh, but like you can convert floats and integers back and forth. Well, it's not gonna let me use that. <laughs> yeah. 
my phone. My phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then uh, loops, and then the list comprehension. I don't know if we'll get all the way to the end, but I, I do hope we can get to dictionaries because then that'll put us in a good place for the NumPy, the pandas, which is what I want to do next, next, the next time I'm talking. So again, we have the same kind of function uh, format. If you know how to make a function, you know how to make an if statement, you know how to do a for any kind of loop, for while loop, same kind of thing. So here's fruits. You just want to go through the list. Now, unlike in in R, you do not need to put anything here to contain it, and that's the same with the if statements. Just write the letter here. Once it sees four, it knows it's looking at something, and then end it with this parenthesis this here, and bam, it will print out what you need it to print out. Uh, what is important though is that like the function, because this is if like when you make a function, if you, for instance, you do not put print, and you just say, tell me what fruits is, it will do nothing because it does everything's in the list and you didn't tell it to print, so it won't print the screen. So if you've run something and you're like, what, what just happened and you didn't see what you thought you would, just pop print in and then it will do what you need it to do. And you can play with it. The, the default for uh, print is next line, uh, but you can tell it to do it. Spaces and tab delimited. So here's a uh, tuple and it works exactly the same thing. You can run it through a uh, for loop and it will do what you expect it to do here, making the product. Also, it will run through a string. So this is just one variable. This is not a list of anything. It's just one string. And here you have for the character in each letter. So it's going to go through each individual letter at a time. You're going to apply this function is upper. And this isn't making it upper, it's checking. It's like, like if you're doing with R, you're like, is this a character? Is this a number? It's the same thing. It's like, is this upper? If true, then it prints that. And it prints it without a space so that you get this nice hello. No. Otherwise, you probably get some type of ghost hello if you put like, hello, or something like that. So, so that's pretty standard, I want to say. And you can see, it knows where it is in this function based off of the indentation. Uh, what I like a lot is this range function that they have it built in. And you can what you can do here is you can range and then you can go to zero a uh, five. It's like sequence along. They have a lot, they have a lot of similar things in R. Uh, the, the best thing here, this is just range and it will do exactly kind of what it does starting from zero up to five uh, and for that that means it goes up to five it doesn't count five it does zero to four and zero and then it does something here it, i put the square in there so you can see how you can put that function and if you just the thing is this is if you just put this here it's a generator you can make generators uh but you cannot print a generator. So you're like, what does this actually do? Unless you put it in the for loop and you print each one, and then you could see start in increment, it won't print the range. You have to put that in some type of uh, for loop or while loop or something to get it to do something. And then the while loops, exactly the same kind of syntax. You don't need any kind of parentheses. Make sure you end with a colon and you have your little spaces to or a tab. Normally you just do a tab when you're writing yourself uh, and then go right through it. And then it uses the same kind of syntax you can find in pretty much all coding where if you wanna do minus plus equal one or you can do the opposite plus equals one and have it go while go to the end of your while loop. 
thing that everybody should be really excited for and that like I am super cool if we end here because this is the best part is list comprehensions. Okay, this is how you can make your one line for loop or complicated for loops. So it's making a list, uh, but it's doing it based off of something you tell it to do. And you can do any kind of thing. You can make your own function and tell you to go through this. So here you have do something. So this is your output. And then here's your little, uh, your uh, statement for some variable in this range. So for each one of that, it's gonna do something and then print it out. So here I've done this is pretty much times two so square. That same thing would have to be done here where you have to add the append and you'd have to make yourself a empty vector instead of you don't have to like say you write this first, you can then rearrange it into this uh, this uh, list instead. And then you get the exact same output but with fewer amounts. And you can make a generator. So this is what I was telling you before, if you put it in a tuple, this makes a generator and you look at this X, you're like, what, what does this mean? It's the same things if you were just looking at range. If you wanna look, inspect each variable, then you need to print it. This is useful for things when you're making a very complicated kind of function, especially if, it's, especially if they're kind of like machine learning stuff. You're making an iterable object, so you have to go through each element. You're saving it, save space. And then uh, you can add if statements, which is normally what I do. You want to say test something, and then only output something if it passes that test. So you want you have a list, or say you have a huge yeah a huge number of lists. You can then test things. You can even test columns for uh, better things. And if it passes this, then you output that, you save it, and then you have your subset list based off of sometimes a complicated. Uh, test structure, sometimes something simple like this, as you can do the if and else. So if you want to do else, no, uh, what did I do? if else, uh, it might be else. All right, well, I'll figure that out later. Uh, this is the same, uh, this is the same thing here that's in this conditional loop. I've never seen anybody write it like this before, but when you're looking at it, you can then see what each line does. So you're doing convert this planet to upper. So there's not is, it's just upper. And then you add this explanation for it. And then it says what you're looping for and then what the condition is. And then you can do the same thing for uh, this function here. So here, here's a function where you've got a bunch of lines and then this exact function here in one line. And obviously you love to do it in just one line. And this is just a simpler version of the function where you, because actually you're just summing it Uh, all right, uh, there's not too much time, so I'm not sure I have enough time to go over the strings and dictionaries. Um, we want to have some more questions. We'll try to help incorporate into the next book.